Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Fighter Bomber, the 1989 Cobra Condor Z25, and its pilot, the Arrow Viper. Now they both make their first appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 92. And they both make their first cartoon appearance in the 1989 Deke animated five-part miniseries Operation Dragonfire in part four. The Cobra Condor is a very large jet toy. It measures around 24 inches long, that's two feet long, with a wingspan of 22 inches. That's almost the same size as 1983 Sky Striker, but I'll actually be comparing it to other vehicles. Such as the 1986 Night Raven, which is a bit longer than the Condor actually, but the Condor's wingspan actually is far beyond that of the Night Raven. And it's still not as long as the longest jet in the G.I. Joe line, the 1988 Phantom Stealth Fighter. But again, the Stealth Fighter doesn't really have wings, but it's still quite wide, but not as wide as the Condor. The Condor Z-25 is a daylight strike fighter bomber with some very interesting features. Even the underside of the Condor Z-25 has some really nice sculpted detail, as well as access to landing gear flaps, as well as the knobs which actuate the internally loaded wing-mounted bombs. As you can see, the cockpit, while the seat is very well detailed, there isn't a lot of control detail in here, which is very unusual. Notice the long black stripe along the fuselage and the forward edge of the wing. That's sometimes known as badger striping on aircraft, and that's meant to absorb some of the sunlight, which could bounce into the pilot's eyes. But in this case, especially along the wing's edge, it's also meant to absorb some of the glinting sunlight so that it can't be spotted from the ground. And here we have the tail gunner's cockpit. I'll just remove this entirely so you can see a bit of the detail. The seat mirrors the detail on the front pilot seat, but you'll notice that this actually does have controls molded into the sides, which is very unusual, but I suppose that's the benefit of having a much wider area for which to sculpt. One of the coolest details on the Condor Z25 are the kill markings. You'll notice that these aren't the generic stars which represent various G.I. Joe vehicles, but in fact, this is a very specific vehicle that this guy has shot down. And that is the 1988 Phantom X-19 Stealth Fighter. In the comic books, these were rivals, and as you can see, it's very much legitimized by the toys themselves. Underneath, we have landing gear, which is just manual. One on the front, and two on the rear here. The landing gear itself is very detailed. Rubber tires over the wheels, and nicely detailed struts and flaps. And now moving on to the weaponry, we have some large missiles, one on each of the two front canards, and one on each of the two rear wingtips, for a total of four altogether. And as you can see, these were just pegged in using the standard G.I. Joe dumbbell peg there. However, the rest of the armament has some gimmicks to it. You notice this vent-like item here, but this is actually an internal thumb wheel. It's very cleverly disguised. And of course, right underneath it, we have a bomb bay for some large bombs. 
So by sticking your thumb or finger in there, you can rotate it. And up to seven of these large bombs can be deployed. When placing them back in to this slot, you just rotate it until you get an empty slot and just put your stuff right back in. However, because there's only seven slots, in order to keep them in, you have to keep the slot sort of midway between two of them in order for it to lock into place or else gravity will just dispense with them. And on the back is one of my favorite gimmicks, seven smaller bombs located in a clear magazine. The magazine holds seven on each side of the wing for a total of 14 of these particular small bombs. There's an unusual construction with this uh, cutout on the front and the back here. And that's because they go along this rail. The tips on the back of the uh, bomb actually has a little divot as well for it to lock into place. And on the other side, there's a push lever and another slot for it to be released. So when you push the lever down, out it comes. It's a simple mechanism, but it works quite well. You also notice that on the other side, I have the bombs facing the other way. You can face them forward or backwards if you want to. While it's fun to watch the bombs drop out from underneath the wings, it's just as cool to watch the bombs drop out from the top end as well. The loss of the weaponry is a little bit controversial because it's the tail gun held in with this circular tail fin. Now a lot of collectors really don't like the circular tail fin because well, traditional tail fins are usually singular and very straight. And this circular thing, while it's a legitimate aerodynamic device, it just doesn't look very military. It looks like something out of NASA's wind tunnel. However, there's a reason for that as well. Because not only can you move the tail gun up and down, but because it's held within a ring, I'm just going to actually uh, push this a bit forward and out just to relieve the tension because mine's a little bit old and warped. But it can move along the ring for a greater range of fire arc. With its long undulating fuselage and back attached but forward swept slightly rounded wings, the Cobra Condor isn't a very aggressive looking vehicle. It's certainly not as aggressive as many other Cobra vehicles and certainly not when compared to the high water mark 1986 Night Raven. Even though this thing is named after a scavenger bird and a very large one, it has a very elegant look. I would actually say this thing looks more like a water crane in gliding flight. It's actually very beautiful. But beauty can be deceptive in this case. And with the press of a button, we go from bomber to twin fighters. Now we've separated the Condor into two parts. The front part being kind of a rocket-like jet. Not having a lot of wings, but the bowed out sections actually do act as kind of a lifting body, I suppose. And you can certainly understand that these canards can be wings. 
However, we've retained two of the large missiles, as well as the large bomb dropping uh, mechanism here with the seven bombs included. However, now we can deploy a second set of landing gear. And while they're in line, kind of like a giant motorcycle, it still works and is perfectly suited for this. And now with the Condor separated, the back half is actually a little bit more interesting as the forward facing portion is now the back of this new vehicle with the connection port actually being the thruster. You can actually kind of swivel that around, but it's nice that the detail is actually there. And now the backward facing tail gunner is now a forward facing pilot. Now as you can see, this thing has now become an attack wing much like a B-2 bomber, but its small size is more likely to be uh, interpreted as a fighter jet now, with a lot of bomb capabilities, of course. Underneath, just like the front half, we have an extra landing gear which can now pop out. So this whole thing can land by itself, and quite stably. Of course, this is one of the reasons why I think that the um, bombs in the magazines can be placed either forward or backwards. Because maybe you want forwards for the combined Condor mode, or backwards for this mode. You can rotate this all the way downwards for a much more cleaner look, especially if you want to highlight the cockpit. You can, of course, deploy the extra landing gear in the combined Condor mode, but it's not really necessary. It's really only meant for the separated mode. Many collectors who, like me, still love this vehicle greatly point out the round tail fin as pretty much the only weird design flaw of this thing. I wouldn't say it's a design flaw myself. Obviously, mo most of the things which are sort of crammed together into the whole of this sort of mishmash are all legitimate aircraft designs. But if there's one thing that I want to point out is the fact that I don't know where the rear thrust is in the combined mode. Is it supposed to be this shell-like detail? It's very strange that there's just no thrust nozzles anywhere. If this was supposed to be its thrust nozzle or, or some type of um, vectored thing, you would think that they would make it a very deep vent-like item like this on the front, but they didn't. I suppose one just has to use their imagination. And now it's time for... Does a modern figure fit it in? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra Footloose figure. And he fits perfectly. But what about the back? He fits there just as well. The Condor Z-25 came with only one pilot, rather unfortunate seeing as there are two crew compartments, but the Aero Viper is a really nice figure with a very interesting accessory. The helmet is removable. It's rather unfortunate that the helmet doesn't have any paint on it because the color kind of washes out some of the detail. It would have been nice if they had painted the visor part black or something. Also, you'll notice that, yes, this is gold plastic, the swirly, sparkly gold plastic, which Hasbro used back in the day. Um, and this is also a hard plastic as well. It's not very flexible. So it might succumb to gold plastic syndrome. In other words, it might become so brittle that it'll break apart. 
I haven't heard any reports of the helmet doing that, but the helmet actually fits on the head, I wouldn't say loosely, but securely. You don't really have to squeeze it on there. So I don't really see the helmet being stressed enough that you would, you know, accidentally crack it. But uh, be careful with it otherwise, because it's also the, the part which is very often missing on an Arrow Viper figure. The figure itself is actually very interesting. It's a, it's a nice sculpt. It's not like way out there, like the, like the 1986 AVAC pilot. But it's also very curious that they went with this color scheme. It certainly doesn't match the Condor, but it doesn't really match the, tra the traditional colors that Cobra pilots have had in the past. Very dark colors or with a lot of red, as we'll see in, the, in a minute. Also, one very interesting thing about the, uh, the figure is the head. The head sculpt has facial hair on it. And usually that's an indication of an individual figure. But the Arrow Viper is supposed to be a generic pilot. You're supposed to have like legions of these guys. So it's very interesting that they went and put the facial hair on there. Another very interesting thing is the uh, sort of Zorro bandit mask that he has going on there. That seems a little strange to have on a pilot head. I would have thought a tra more traditional hood going around the face would have been better than something going across it. Well, like I said, the actual sculpt itself is rather nicely. Also, gray harnesses and lots of little details sort of picked out, like the gold button and the gold latches. That's really nice. You also notice that he has this sort of stitch work, which is, I guess, part of the um, G suit that he's wearing. But one really interesting thing is, is that this is another type of uh, paint job which Hasbro usually just sort of cheaps out on. But you can see that the stitch work is, is not like all around his leg here, but actually goes up in a pattern. And then up across his waist piece. And then back down across the other leg. And again, this is something which typically Hasbro wouldn't paint in there because this is his waist piece is a black piece of black plastic so it's very interesting that they went and continued the design especially on his back because you know he's sitting on there you wouldn't normally see that so it's not really a display thing which you absolutely need to see but it's cool that they actually went and did that and now just to take a look at what has come before just to compare them color wise and sculpt wise here we have the 1984 wild weasel from the rattler who actually is an individual, but you know, his helmet is not removable, so you could use him as a generic fighter pilot, I suppose. And here we have the 1986 Strato Viper, as well as the 1986 AVAC pilot. Now, as you can see, this is what I'm talking about. He has a lot of red and black, red and gray and black, mostly red and some black. And nothing like that on the Arrow Viper. Very strange. But speaking of color spectrums, in 1989, we also get, in the basic lineup, a Night Viper. Who has a lot of green and black on him. And I think that he makes a great co-pilot. Especially if you have a figure which has maybe some broken pegs either on his legs or on his helmet and you can't quite get him on to get the accessories back onto this guy he makes a great co-pilot so you don't really have to throw him out or anything like that but while the Arrow Viper generally I think should have had a second one it's actually very very hard to find a complete Arrow Viper on the aftermarket because his helmet I don't know Maybe it's because the helmet doesn't look like it belongs to him. I mean, he has a lot of little gold accents on him, so it does go. But I, I don't know. I don't know why the helmet in particular always seems to be missing with this figure on the aftermarket. But here, I've got myself another Arrow Viper. Perfectly meant and is actually fairly reasonable. 
it's really just the helmet which really bumps up the value on the aftermarket. But here, I've put an air mask on them. This is 1986 Lifeline's oxygen mask. But you can put, like, an oxygen mask either from the 1985 parachute pack or 1984 ripcord. They go really well. And he doesn't really need a helmet after all if you put something like that on him. And of course, I think we all know who the opposite number on the G.I. Joe side would be for the Aero Viper, and that is the 1988 Ghost Rider, pilot of the Phantom X-19 Stealth Fighter. If you're looking for a Condor Z-25 or its pilot, the Aero Viper, on the aftermarket, there's actually not much I need to tell you about as far as what to look out for for breakages, because it's actually a fairly sturdy toy, and even the figure is. I mean, I already told you that this figure comes with a gold plastic helmet, but because it doesn't sit on his head either too tightly or too loosely, I never feel like I'm going to break it. And just like the Condor Z25, it actually has three gimmicks on it. The thumb wheel, mid fuselage, bomb activation. It also has a push button separator, as well as the slides for both wingtips for the small bombs. They're actually fairly simple mechanical devices and I don't see them breaking anytime soon, even with heavy use. The only thing you really do have to look out for is missing pieces. All of the missiles. You have four of these large missiles, seven in the main fuselage, and 14 spread out between the two wings. And of course the helmet is something which is often missing on the figure. It's rather unfortunate because I know a lot of collectors might think of 1989 being, you know, maybe something not, not a year they want to collect. And maybe this design isn't really as iconic as, let's say, the 1986 Night Raven. But I think it's an excellent toy. You just really have to get it into your hands in order to experience it. It's elegant and it's sturdy. And it's actually quite fun, not only just to play around with, but also have, you have a, a lot of display options splitting it in half. The Condor Z-25 isn't fully based on a real aircraft, but is definitely inspired by two at least. While the forward swept wings are generally the domain of fighter craft for their tight turning circle ability, there is a bomber which does have this, the prototype Convair XB-53 bomber. You'll notice it also has the wings mounted nearer the rear of the fuselage, just like the Condor. And, while the separating flying wing is nothing new, I think the designers of the Condor drew inspiration specifically from the YB-49 test bomber. In addition to the flying wing shape, it has two bubble canopies for crew in the front and back, just like the Condor.
today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra and even though the vehicle the the iconic wild weasel from 1984 from the pilot the well that's all the time I have right now please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.